Ben Vitti, who's our Director of Collections and Exhibitions. Um, we're very pleased to have been invited by the city and everyone here at the Rights Heritage Center to take part in, in what's been already a very great Pride uh, Week celebration and commemoration. We're excited about what's happened and we're looking forward to uh, what remains of this important week. Uh, we were racking our brains uh, when this was being planned uh, months ago uh, as, as to how the sewer house might be able to contribute and, and, and lend a voice to this, this important conversation. We like to say that the sewers were believers in equality in all its forms, and that's very much true. Uh, and one of the things that we, we do try to talk about with visitors, and, and there's, there's an exhibit in that I uh, worked on about, about a year and a half ago, that uh, includes the story that we're going to try to tell for you tonight. Uh, the story of Charlotte Cushman, who was one of the most well-known women in the 19th century English-speaking world, whose <coughs> legacy discussed becomes obscured, uh, largely because of her identity, until she is uh, almost all but forgotten, except to historians of the theater by the middle uh, 20th century. Uh, she's becoming more and more um, represented in scholarship. Uh, Matt and I both listening to a really interesting podcast in which a, a recent historian who's append a new biography, new-ish, on her says she really deserves to be the subject of a Spielberg movie or a Netflix miniseries because her life is so riveting. Uh, you have to really you know, buckle in and hear everything to, to believe all that she accomplished and all that she endured, all that she was, and the times that, that she was. Uh, so much to so many people. Uh, who here has heard of Charlotte Cushman before to me today? Well, I know Joyce has. <laughs> you know, uh, and into that. Um, but we wanted to go a little bit deeper, even than we, we can do with most of our visitors who get maybe a few minutes to, to think about where the Seward family legacy intersects with modern day discussions or 19th century discussions, what we might call LGBTQIA issues. Um, so if you have questions, uh, you can just say, hey, guy in the yellow shirt, and Matt and I will try to answer them. <laughs> or if you want to email us, our emails are here. You can also find them on the Seward House uh, website. Um, so we want to get at the incredible life and legacy of Charlotte Cushman. It's my favorite painting of her, probably the least like her actual likeness to have been done. Thomas Sully, you might recognize that name. There's a beautiful Thomas Sully of Francis the Seward House Museum. Uh, taken when she was uh, relatively young in her career. Uh, and I just love this sort of ferocity and determination, maybe even a little playfulness on her expression here. Uh, we want to get into her incredible life and legacy. A very brief overview, a bit of 101 on Charlotte Cushman. Here's, here's an image of her from about 10 years later by William Page. Uh, born in Boston in 1816, Cushman was originally drawn to opera. Uh, at an early age, she lost her father uh, and uh, thought maybe she could make a go in the theater. By all accounts, she had a good voice, uh, which fails her in 1835. Uh, she appears in the Marriage of Figaro, uh, and she decides to switch to becoming uh, an actress and specializing in, in, in tragedies. Uh, and was soon dazzling the theatrical world uh, when she was cast as Lady Macbeth. She soon began to portray male characters in stages all across this country uh, and across the English-speaking world. One of the first American actresses to be greeted with respect uh, in England, which had very high standards for its thespians. Uh, and she was regarded as the first American actress who was worthy of the British stage and sharing it with British actors and actresses. And actresses. She performed for Queen Victoria, among others, and largely in male roles, Hamlet, Romeo, Cardinal Woolsey. Uh, over the 40-year uh, career, she amasses to become one of the best-known women in the English-speaking world. Her retirement from the stage inspired a farewell ceremony described as the most spectacular in the history of the American theater before her death just shy of 60 of pneumonia in Boston. She also has a number of sewer-specific connections, which we're going to get into, and on several occasions visited and even performed here in Auburn. So uh, residents of our own community would have in the 1870s have had the chance to have seen this legend uh, in, uh, in their own eyes. Uh, so without further ado, uh, oh, uh, how famous much, right? 19th century people from kind of made this slide. Famous enough that we were uh, a whole Charlotte Cushman brand of cigars. We know Mr. Seward loved his cigars. Matt, any evidence that Seward ever smoked with Cushman? Mm, yeah. It's too bad. Hall of Fame, here she is. Uh, at NYU, uh, a great porcelain set of her. She's actually the Romeo here. Her sister often portrayed Julia. Uh, Matt's going to get into some of her theatrical career, and we're going to try to give you a deeper insight into her life uh, from beyond. So as Jeff mentioned, 
you know, she has this very story and very, very long theatrical career. Uh, and I'm not going to do it any justice tonight just doing the overview. Uh, we can definitely recommend some sources if you, uh, you want to do some further reading. So I'm just going to hit some of the highlights here. But uh, as Jeff kind of already mentioned, Charlotte Cushman, uh, by her own description as a child, she was a good tomboy, she was active, she was adventurous, uh, and she was also a good student, but she left school at about 13. Uh, but she was very well spoken uh, and uh, very drawn. People often uh, speak about the way that they're just kind of drawn to her. Uh, but her father is a little interesting in that he was a businessman, uh, and he kind of made this fortune and he lost it. He passes away when she's still pretty young. She's in her teenage years. Um, and she kind of becomes responsible for providing for the family. She has three other sisters, uh, she has a mother, uh, and she does, as Jeff mentioned, have a pretty lovely singing voice. So she thinks that she's going to become an opera singer. She does that. She performs in Albany, she performs in Syracuse, she performs in New York City, uh, and her performances there are pretty well received uh, as far as the local newspapers are concerned. So much so that she travels to New Orleans uh, for a series of uh, performances. And the New Orleans paper says that she cannot sing at all, and she might want to switch to acting. Uh, so she does that. She uh, enlists the help of a couple of uh, pretty well-known acting coaches of the time. Uh, and then in 1836, she gets her pretty, kind of her first big break, and then she's cast as Lady Macbeth. And this is a pretty important uh, moment in her life because she takes that character and does something with it that's really never been done before. She makes Lady Macbeth very energetic. She's very young at this point as well. She portrays her as pretty much no one ever has. Uh, and the papers really kind of uh, are, uh, are very kind of interested in this. Uh, they praise her for that. Uh, and that's really kind of her launching point into uh, sort of the big times of the year. And as I mentioned, Charlotte, and this is one of the things that I love about her, she's someone who really understands the importance of name recognition and branding. So, She's a singer, she's an actress, but she also has a good friend, Sarah Joseph Hale, who's the editor of Goody's Lady Book, uh, as well as the, uh, the Lady's Companion magazine. So Charlotte writes some short stories, some poetry, things like that. So now she's dabbling in writing. Some people know her only from that because she was uh, uh, pretty, uh, pretty successful with that as well. Um, and she's kind of, historians have said, playing to her strengths. So, She's not what we would consider classically attractive, and a lot of newspapers at the time kind of say that. She is uh, a little bit masculine in appearance. She's tall, she has a square jaw, but again, she is very captivating, very well educated, and she just uses that to draw you in. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, and then in 1837, she gets a couple more roles. Uh, one of the things that she's most well remembered for in the theater is her, uh, is her portrayal of uh, Nancy Sykes in Oliver Twist. And she does something, um, she really studies the role. She lives for a few weeks in the slums of New York's Lower East Side. Uh, and she actually starts trading clothing with, uh, with the, the impoverished people, the immigrants there. Uh, so uh, there's a little note uh, in one of the playbills uh, that the audience members were complaining about smell in the theater because she had all these original clothes on her uh, to try to make that character really come to life. Um, and then she does a, kind of a complete 180. In 1842, she decides that she wants to get into theater administration. So she's still acting, but she becomes the administrator of Philadelphia's Walnut Street Theater, which was a very unusual job for a woman at the time. Uh, almost always a man, but she, again, is very celebrated for that job. She gets some very big performances uh, in Philadelphia. And as Jeff had mentioned in, in the introduction, though, she's still mainly an actress. And you can't be a world-class actress if you don't have a world-class tour of Europe, specifically England, uh, and well received in London. So she decides that she's going to do that. Uh, she becomes friends with some really well-known actors and actresses in London. Uh, she is a character of the Half Sisters, which is a pretty famous novel from 1848, is based on her, uh, and she uh, spends a few years uh, in Europe. Uh, she becomes romantic partners, and I'm not going to step on Jeff's toes here because this is what he's exploring. Uh, with a young lady, uh, and they start, uh, they start dressing the lady, uh, and they're known as they are a female married couple. Um, and I think that's pretty interesting that uh, that's the, uh, the opinion in Europe, they're a married couple, not so much in uh, the United States when they come back. Uh, and uh, so Cushman, she uh, has all these uh, uh, interesting moral engagements, and then in 1849, she's now a recognized international star, which means that she can demand the price uh, or the payment, rather, of some of the biggest male stars in the United States. So she comes back, um, 
and uh, she acts for several years, and she makes pretty much her fortune. At this point, her fortune is said to be about six hundred thousand dollars, and that's uh, about 1850. So don't add a zero; it would be like two thirds of a zero to that. So uh, she's made her fortune, and she decides that she's going to retire. Uh, she goes uh, to Rome, uh, where there's a big uh, American expat community, and she founds uh, her famous household of jolly bachelor women, uh, mostly artists, sculptors, uh, musicians, writers, things like that. And it's there where she meets uh, the woman that's going to be pretty much for the rest of her life her uh, lifelong female companion. Uh, she uh, uh, dates several other people. Uh, she actually uh, dates one woman for several years, and they get into a fist fight. Uh, and she eventually leaves, leaves the uh, Jolly Bachelor household. Uh, but her lifelong uh, female companion after this is uh, a young sculptor by the name of Stevens or Stevens, I'm sorry, pronounce that incorrectly. Um, and she actually cares for Kushman when she gets ill. We're going to talk about that uh, a little later uh, in the uh, in the program. And in 1869, she's diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, she does undergo surgery and unfortunately does not uh, eradicate the cancer completely. Uh, so she's in pretty poor health for the rest of her life. Uh, but again, something that we're going to cover a little bit later in the, uh, in the program is that even though she's uh, she's suffering from this, uh, she does. Uh, uh, she continues with the theater. She does mainly dramatic readings. And that's what she does here in Auburn in 1874, or sorry, 1872 and then 1875. Uh, and that's pretty much her medical books up now. Uh, it certainly costs quite a bit of money. She travels internationally for surgery. Um, so she's doing that. Um, and then, uh, and as Jeff mentioned, she passes away uh, of pneumonia in 1876. Very, very sad. Her funeral is quite small. That's uh, the way that she wanted it. Uh, it was described as simple, sweet, and touching. She buried in Boston. Uh, and then the lapse into obscurity. Uh, so in short, the reason that uh, Cheryl Cushman is really not as well remembered as I think that we all think that she should be is that, again, something that Jeff is going to cover, uh, sexuality between women was much more accepted in the 19th century, and as we transition into the 20th century, that really doesn't become the case. Uh, and she uh, kind of fades out of the public eye. Uh, so that's her general biography. I'm going to pass it back to Jeff, um, and we're going to get a little deeper into some of those details. <clears throat> um, so Matt mentioned we're going to put the recommended reading that we turn to. We don't want to for a second. Ken and Matt and I are experts on Charlotte Cushman. We knew just enough to get ourselves in trouble, and we committed to giving this talk, and then went down uh, to the research rabbit <laughs> hole and, and searched for information on some, some great and seminal uh, texts, and I think that the best one you can get is from 2000, Lisa Merrill's Romeo was a woman, Charlotte <laughs> Cushman and her circle of female spectators. But I want to be careful, too. Uh, I don't want to pass myself off as an expert historian in 19th century sexuality, uh, so I wanted to lean a little bit into some of the sources to begin to offer some context for how, when conversations about Charlotte Cushman happened uh, in America and around the world, how people were talking, what they were talking about, the words and the coded languages they used when they discussed sexuality, because there's a very different set of, of, of uh, linguistic tools than we would employ today. But just like today, many uh, who um, were fa uh, uh, fans of the theater in the 19th century thought that they knew this woman, this celebrity, because she was famous, the same way that many feel like we can know uh, celebrities because we spend time reading about them see their performances and we think, wow, that person is incredible. Uh, and I, I feel like I know that. People were often talking about Charlotte Cushman, uh, her public life, many personae she would portray on the stage, and then and sometimes hushed conversations. And in some ways, it's a secret. In some ways, it's very much not that Cushman was living what, to many, was a very unorthodox lifestyle. But ironically, the unorthodox lifestyle she led uh, granted her greater entree into sort of the, the sexual, I don't, I don't want to call it experimentation, but, but almost openly living in, in communities like the jolly um, female, female households, uh, because there were some very strange gender dynamics at play in the 19th century uh, that changed, uh, explaining as Matt suggests why uh, Cushman's place in public memory has changed. And they're complicated, and to really do them justice, I wanted to, to Something I don't usually do in giving a talk is, is to read a little bit to you um, to make sure we get our story straight. Um, we call our talk tonight, Charlie Cushman, 
uh, an icon, a symbol, a family friend of the Jewish. And, and what I mean by that, I'll read you the quote, and then some more that I didn't put on the screen. Uh, from, from Meryl, Charlotte Cushman, a woman who loved other women, was a lightning rod for many of the culture shifts and changes of her era. In a period when most middle class women were admonished to be passive, submissive, domestic, and above all, chaste, she endeavored to support herself, her family, and later, the women with whom she shared her life. To her country people, Cushman's fame was a source of national pride, but her gender transgressions on the stage puzzled as well as pleased them. During her lifetime, as Cushman became an object of extraordinary renown, an object of public consumption, she came to be seen as an icon or a sign in whom the threads of gender, nationality, and sexuality were interwoven for her spectators. So some context about Charlotte Cushman transgressing these sexual boundaries. In her day, living in a time, surprisingly, we think of Victorian era as incredibly repressive. And, and for many, it was. Uh, it's a very different kind of a history to talk about uh, what it was to be um, a gay man in the 19th century, with many restrictive draconian laws on the books, because men were considered in the 19th century the sexual gender with, with primal urges. Uh, and women were considered chaste, almost asexual. Uh, so there are laws on the books. Hundreds of people are arrested every year just in New York alone uh, for breaking these laws. They call them laws of buggery or sodomy. And there isn't a, a, a similarly enmeshed legal backstory to, to the women's side of this 19th century history. For reasons I'm sort of hinting at here, this perception of their, their chasteness, um, which Cushman uses, exploits, reading her milieu like she might read her audience wonderfully to live the closest that we might, we can't know her, so her fans really could know her, but it seems exploited to live maybe her truest kind of self. Um, so there is a fluidity. Uh, language is a big deal. We want to get the terms right, but we know that when we talk about LGBTQIA issues, we do so in a way that would make absolutely no sense to someone living in the 19th century, whether they were part of that world or not. So I want to just touch on terminology uh, and turn to another scholar, Claire Heyman, a, a historian on the, on the history of gender and sexuality. And she writes this really interesting article where she says, try this. Go to the National Archives and type in LGBTQ. See what you get. You're going to get Stonewall. You're going to get stuff in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. Hmm. Imagine how hard it was to get into to 19th century stories into the Equal Rights Heritage Center on, on this front. You're not going to get much deeper than that using those terms because uh, according to Heyman, the word homosexual was not used for the first time until 1869. The word gay to describe a sexual relationship uh, is not been used until the mid 20th century. Which is not to say there's no history of same-sex love or gender variance before our invention of these modern words. Understanding of sexuality has changed over time, just as the words we use to define them have too. Many scholars today use phrases like same-sex love to describe same-sex relations, love and sex in the past, but refer to today the LGBTQIA community. Historian Judith Bennett would use words like lesbian-like to describe Charlotte Cushman's sexuality. The word love, lesbian would have meant nothing to her, would have been, would have been alien to her. Heyman and scholars like her believe this language and context matters a great deal, so do we. But keeping the specificity of the Cushman's past allows us to resist imposing our own categories, our own labels, and kind of binary system, or our sensibility to her actions. Which brings me to my last point. In her private life, Charlotte Cushman was involved with a number of women, what society referred to as strong female friendships, which did not arouse the suspicions of many, because as I say, women were then considered incapable of erotic desire and the term that we <laughs> Nonetheless, Charlotte Cushman is clearly breaking some sexual boundaries. We do like to think of the 19th century as a time of, of separate spheres, at least in terms of the, the working and home life side that women were supposed to be relegated to a domestic sphere, men in the public. We talk about the women of the civil family. We talk about them breaking against these barriers. So how intuitive men would call Women like, um, uh, unsexed, how dare these unsexed women 
go to Albany, petition, lobby, organize. Uh, so you might think that if they are threatened by women taking on intellectual agency and lobbying for their political rights, property rights, suffrage, that what could be more alarming to men in a patriarchal 19th century society than a powerful, wealthy woman who managed her own career, uh, all of her own clients, she's never hired a manager, never hired a man to do her books, to book shows for her, to see a woman like that doing what they would call breach work, wearing men's clothes and portraying some of the most popular male characters of the stage. He playing sheep, uh, as, as this article says. And another, another great story, Jill Dolan writes, uh, getting to this, it's quite a chronology. How can we define lesbian in a historical moment in which this terminology was unknown and packed with an unthought? Cushman is a liminal figure, which means she sort of exists on both sides of the boundary. She's a transitional figure. One whose life tread the borderline of 19th century notions of masculinity and femininity, femininity and complicated the various ways the most intimate relationships were understood by those around her. We have to feel bad as historians sometimes. We do spend time poking around in the intimate personal lives of those we study, sometimes shamelessly poking into the love letters of the super family. That's none of our business. We should feel it. it gives us an understanding of these people. And, 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 and I think Cushman's fair game for the same reason. Scholars that began to do the same to her. Cushman understood and performed her passions for other women, lacking even a language that would help her name for longings, desires, and sexual customs, lacking even a name to describe how she felt, who she was, which is pretty hard to wrap your mind around. She towered over the men who played alongside her. There's another thing that you might consider how intimidating this woman who was, who was larger than the average man she stared at the stage, who towered over the talents. Eclipse when she got to England, people were writing, not only is she good enough to be here, she's better than her leading men. Night after night, she's better than the, the, the best actors in all of the realm. Playing 30 male, male roles, she once performed for Queen Victoria, as I mentioned, who at the end of the night could not believe that the person she'd enjoyed watching captivated her was in fact actually a woman. Millions of people watched her perform. And theater historian Charles Shattuck describes their appreciation for talents approached the form of personal worship. Her younger sister Susan becomes an actress in 1839. These two often perform together. And then she'd cycle through a number of other strong female only. She played the Romeo to their Juliet. She would take the male part and perform when she could with women. Lisa Merrill attributes part of her love that her character at a time when the women's rights movement was gathering force. Her appeal lay the perception also that she offered something new. This is kind of the, the irony here, the, the great paradox of her career, that she should be incredibly intimidating to men, and yet she is welcomed as a breath of fresh air to the theater, which in America, at least in the 19th century, early admit to reformers like Francis Seward, the theater was bound up in other vices like gambling, prostitution, drinking. These were, these were the pursuits of, of, of lecherous people. Theaters were body captains. Women showed their ankles and calves. These were not considered respectable places, despite the fact that in many parts of the English-speaking world, the height of, of high culture was well done Shakespeare or great theater. In America, the perception was that theater was a low form of pleasure. Because, uh, so, Interestingly, her, as, as Merle puts it, flamboyant affairs are tolerated uh, because she offers something sort of savory to the theater. If it's believed, and historians say it is, uh, that only men have sexual urges, and uh, if society wants to convince itself that that's true and tell itself that again and again and again, but believes it, then here comes a woman who is going to play by those rules in a certain sense. Uh, the absence of male relationships throughout her life give her a pass. She is not seen as a sexualized person because she never takes a husband. She never has children. One theater reviewer, after seeing her play Romeo, said, you know what, I think, here's a film critic, 1840s, Romeo should henceforth only be played by a woman because two women together could best portray passionate love without suggesting vice. 
And if you know that a man playing Romeo inescapably led the audience to think about sex, if it's a man and a woman up there, your minds are going there. But if it's two women, this is chaste. It rules out the possibility of sex according to the mores, and therefore allows folks to be under the high abstract romantic love. 19th century critic Lawrence Garrett once praised Miss Cush Cushman, saying that she had and I quote now, a weird genius, somber imagination, great sensibility, but why she's really a success? Her celibate condition. Her celibacy is why she can do this, and she's non-threatening, and she legitimizes the theater by almost sanitizing it. Here's what we've not seen with a man, so she must be chaste and celibate. <laughs> so she plays these parts, the breaches part, strong characters. Um, these biases meant that Cushman could, in some sense, live in the open without being shunned. Which is not to say the mores of her country were tolerant to openly embracing what we might call today, and she wouldn't, an LGBTQIA lifestyle. After the Civil War, the government cracked down on, on, on marriage arrangements, what could legally be quantified as a couple of one for Catholics. So we know that was an important thing for, for gay rights movement in our own time. Love being love, couples being able to legally marry. There are so many technical, federal, legal benefits to the institution. After the Civil War, we began to see a dichotomized marriage is only between a man and a woman. We see a ramping up of, of anti-gay legislation designed to punish mostly male members of this community. Uh, the historian Stephanie Coombs writes, this was also the heyday of the doctrine of separate spheres and true women. When women were assumed to be pure and asexual, completely different from men, who were often referred to as the grosser sex. The grosser sex. This is a great um, piece of art from a recent Atlantic article. Uh, uh, were they gay? The mystery of same-sex love in the 19th century. Said that word, how do we quantify behaviors in the same? Shifting attitudes towards marriage opened up a different way for two women to live together. And throughout the 19th century, many women, uh, we might call Sean Cushman here, entered openly into what we might call and were called for new legal strictures prohibited it, Boston marriages. Two women marrying and living openly as a couple uh, in communities, having uh, shared finances, and living legally in almost a common law way with man and wife. They were called Boston marriages because it was happening most frequently in New England, where there were lots of young ladies of means growing up, being educated. Later on, these would be called uh, Wellesley marriages. Uh, growing up and deciding as they, they entered the world, they didn't want to partner off with a man. They made a, cl a close and strong and intimate emotional friendship with a woman and wanted to spend their life with that person. And so they did, and they entered what were called Boston marriages. They were unregistered, but in their communities were permitted to live as married couples. And so we'll find a couple times where Cushman says, I am married to person A, B, or C. And, and she meant it. Those, those terms matter too. But being able to say that back then is something I bet many people didn't think was, was, was a possibility. We were in these Boston marriages. Um, women sharing their lives together in a way that was functionally indistinguishable from heterosexual marriage, except for the part uh, according uh, to um, this article. Except for the part where society chose to believe that a sexual component existed between these two women. That was the only part that was missing, though it was fine. <laughs> Plus, it was considered perfectly normal for heterosexual women to have crushes on each other, to be affectionate and so forth. It was believed that as, as women, middle class and upper class women, grew up, they were being groomed for the inevitable, eventual, desirable, according to society, husband, it would have been taboo for these young women, it would have been thought promiscuous for them to have become emotionally and physically involved in a man until they married, yet they would be permitted to practice uh, the, the hallmarks of coupling off, kissing, petting, being fond of each other with another woman, because it was believed women didn't have sexual desires. So what they were basically doing was just practicing for their future husband. <laughs> Nothing to see here. And society not only permits this, but it is, it, is, it is openly happening. 
So it's not this sort of black and white repressive Victorian culture in which no, no, what we might consider at work and current behavior uh, was permitted. This is, this is happening and happening openly. Uh, a pair of women who actually had a sexual relationship could easily managed to be together without arousing suspicion that it was anything more than this perfectly normal feminine affection. Uh, all sorts of interesting stories uh, of men and women. We're not going to talk about men much tonight, but we know the stories of Abraham Lincoln and his strong emotional friendship with Joshua Speed, who he meets as a young man. There are itinerant lawyers together traveling across the prairie on the circuit, spending night after night in tavern beds together and developing an emotional closeness that comes out in letters to each other in which they, they bear their hearts, they speak of their manly love for each other. They even, men like Lincoln, write fondly about these bedside encounters. They miss each other when they're with their wives. They're thinking about these men because they miss them, they're close to them. Uh, William Seward, same thing. I had a friend that he met in Union College named David Burton, who he was very close with. He once told Francis he couldn't love her as much as he loved Francis Burton. Uh, David Burton, he wasn't able. He loved him more than he loved anybody else. Burton wrote letters to him and signed them off, yours until death. One great letter, Burton writes to Seward, 1823, I feel my intercourse with you even more than with my own family. In our absence together, we are supplied this minutely confidential correspondence. I've not had spirit sufficient to hold the pen after separation for long, but tonight I return to this sheet, and often, with a stupid helplessness and pleasing contempt at my now superior energy. Forgive me, Harry, which is the word used to be called, for neglecting you as I have done. You must be certain that your interest in my affections is as strong as when you and I were in New York. I feel that Athens has not lessened your hold upon me, and I am ashamed by the infrequency of my letters. James Garfield uh, had a friend in college, Harry Rowe. He runs wrote to him, future president, Dear Harry, actually, Harry, dear, do you know how much I miss you in the school, the church, at home, in labor, or leisure? Sleeping or waking, the want of your presence is felt. I knew I loved you, but you loved a larger boy than I ever knew you could build. A few months later, he would write, I would that we might lie in each other's arms together again for one more wakeful night. Interesting, these, these, these friendships. Ambiguous relationships and arrangements weren't uncommon in Cushman's time. The Massachusetts capital, for instance, home to these Boston marriages between two women. And according to the scholar Peggy Weishart, it didn't necessarily occur to friends to wonder what their sex life was like. Women were perceived as non sexual to begin with, but most people assumed if they didn't have husbands, they wouldn't have any interest in sex. <laughs> what about these female friendships? <laughs> Encouraged to practice romance, just not with men. The linguistic scholar Heather Rose Jones writes, the starting presumption that there was no potential for sexual activity between women had its limits, but this polite social fiction was part of the essential foundation of the concept of romantic friendships between women who expressed undying devotion to each other, just like Lincoln and Speed, Seward and Burton, kissed and embraced freely. Maybe Lincoln and Seward were we don't really know. Who considered it the highest aspiration to live happily, even at required quiet retirement with their female. From the modern point of view, this creates a level of confusion. Were these women participating in homoerotic relationships, or was the simple performance of non-sexual friendship modes that would become inextricably merged with sexual advice later? You really can't always know. The answer is something quite common, and Cushman is a great piece. Uh, her biographer Lisa Merrill talks about her having this love that bore new no name. She didn't have a name for it, she didn't have the, the language the vocabulary. To really articulate and describe what it was that she was feeling as a sexual being, as a person of society, while permitting her certain biases, also would never allow her to come fully in the open uh, and become public that these relationships were more than female friendships, it was more than romantic play acting. These were sexual, these were serious, these were marriages in every way, shape, and form. Christian was well aware of this. Uh, she shields the public from this. She won't talk about this in interview. She selectively burns a lot of her letters. She had lovers that she worried were not discreet and had to have very hard conversations with them. What was fine at home could not be talked about in certain companies. She knew firsthand she had two relationships, one end, one nearly end, because a family member caught on and there was more than just female friendship happening here. 
became aware of the sexually charged nature of these relationships and, and put a stop to it and called her all sorts of names. One of the quotes I gave earlier that pushed me was that she, she puzzled as much as she pleased her thousands. They were sometimes puzzled, especially as the years go by and she's in her 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. She's still living with these women. Wasn't she supposed to be doing this just until the husband came along? Why did she keep not taking one? And if it came out that there was something sexual going on, then context and pretext in these relationships would change and suddenly they would fall into taboo camps and possibly risk of running afoul of the law and enduring the scores and slights. In the US, she occasionally found her relationships with others described by even her own family as morally, socially, and physically injurious. Some called her unnatural for her desires when they found out. Even Walt Whitman, who many LGBTQA advocates might look to for examples of gay rights, uh, went on the record. He had a couple of poems, a couple of homoerotic uh, in the 1860s. Uh, he was asked, do you believe that semisexual emotions and actions can occur between the same gender, man and man, woman and woman? Uh, and he said, no, these are morbid inferences, and all of this is disavowed by me, and this kind of behavior seems damnable. Which explains, to get back to why her late life uh, finds her career is waning and her stock drops, you know, disappears from public memory. Towards the end of her life, the death and after her death, attitudes were turning against, hardening against these independent unmarried women, especially against mannish women in general. With the rise of late 19th century sexologists, Oscar Wilde's trial during public in 1895, characteristics that have been praised became seen suddenly as deviant, as other, as unacceptable. Descriptions of pushing shift in tone, the lining of this reframing, the absence of men in her life was translated to the absence of love, her lovers eventually embraced from the record, their passion ended up biographies, less than post 40 readers view her as. We don't think she is. Uh, let's get gossipy and talk about the many ways of the talk about. The many loves of Charlotte Cushman that lighten up the tone a little bit. But living, living this life wasn't easy. I said, I don't want to sort of get too lighthearted. Because none of this was easy. It was always complicated. And even our ability to understand it becomes cloudy. We don't speak the same language when it comes to a very heart and sexuality. It seems as if the first person that Charlotte Cushman um, enters into what stories might call a lesbian life relationship with is Anne Hampton Brewer, newspaper correspondent, poet, novelist, uh, who uh, comes into Cushman's orbit in 1842 as she's coming into Philadelphia to take on management of a theater that that mentioned on Walnut Street. Uh, and this is the first time they're only together for a very short while, a matter of months, uh, where Cushman learns she has to be careful. There are limits to what's an acceptable female friendship because while they enjoy spending time together, Cushman is in that housing situation. So they're spending much of their time at Anne Hampton Brewer's home. Her brother catches on that there's more to them than the innocent goings on of these chaste women preparing for marriage, discovers a sexual component of their relationship, and basically casts her out. It's a devastating blow to Hampton Brewer, uh, who will years and years after describe her brief time in a relationship in the arms of Cushman as the glory beam, brief but glorious beam of sunshine in my existence. She writes a number of erotic diary entries about their time together, uh, capturing the sexual elements of it. It required all the duty binding her to let her go, and she felt thereafter, in her words in her diary, completely out at sea, without rudder or compass. So they, they meet each other around the Walnut Street Theater. Uh, Tubman be uh, Cushman becomes uh, friends with her. They briefly enter a relationship. Brewer's family ends it. But Cushman is not alone very long. Still in Philadelphia, jilted by the Brewer family, Cushman decides she's going to have her portrait done. Matt talked about her basically her marketing, her realization that she needs to, to be as visible as possible so she's in worlds of literature and art. So she goes to the studio of Thomas Sullivan, who paints a lovely portrait of her result at the beginning of the talk. Where she meets 
his young daughter, uh, Rosalind. From uh, her father's studio, Rosalind Sully has uh, built her own studio and is doing her own work. This is a, a portrait of her. And began to, to take on her own clients and dabble in portraiture in her own right. Uh, Thomas Sully quite likes Charlotte Cushman, invites her into the home of his family, sees her daughter and Cushman having a very formative relationship and is, is accepting of that. Uh, actually takes them around traveling together. She becomes a part of the family uh, and stays with them for stretches. In this case, they're able to, whether it's through the discretion that Cushman is forced to learn uh, or, or better fortune, to carry on a sexual relationship, Cushman writes, July 5th, 1844, her diary, slept frozen. Uh, not long afterwards, Cushman gives uh, Rosalie a ring, and they tell each other they are, mar they are married for themselves. They are married. This is the first time Cushman will give, give a ring, take a partner, and say, you see the end word, we're married together. Unfortunately, love has to wait, because this is precisely the time she's figured out the pattern that works. She's, she's now using the language of marriage. Uh, they are in a sexual relationship, but Cushman's career is getting so hot that she has to, she wants to take the next step professionally, take that tour that Matt described, and in 1844, she has to leave. It's heartrending for both of them. They promise they're going to wait for each other. Sully is too young to go with Father Walt Leonard. Of they're not, much as they say they're married, there are still the rules of their society that they have to live by, especially with uh, a patriarchal society, and Thomas Sully saying, Father will stay here. So Cushman embarks in November 1844 for England. They promise to stay true. Cushman's uh, shipboard uh, diary recounts nights of erotic dreams of Rosalie, their devoted bond, and how she cannot wait until the day they are reunited. Unfortunately, Cushman's tour is so successful it would last years. And while she's away, it seems the heart did wander, and she breaks it off. She's found women in Europe. She's she's in this world of theater. She's come back to be successful, and she finds new loves. She writes Rosalie to break it off, and learns not that long after that the heartbroken Rosalie died not long after receiving the news of uh, what was called a, a uh, fever. But then he said heartbreak. Uh, and Cushman took the news so hard that she also suffered a mental collapse. She recovers, and one of her longest relationships follows with Matilda Mary Hayes, uh, another intellectual uh, journalist, actress. They met because, what else? They were cast side by side as Romeo and Juliet on the European stage. Uh, Elizabeth Eric Browning was part of this jolly uh, bachelorette community writes that I understand that she, Miss Cushman, and Miss Hayes have made vows of celibacy and of eternal attachment to each other. They live and dress alike. It is a female marriage, or a Boston marriage. They meet in 1848, appearing together at the Theatre Royale in Bristol, <coughs> Bristol and begin a 10-year relationship. They wore tailored shirts and jackets, li living together, dressing alike, uh, and Matilda would often take a masculine name. She would go by when they were together, either Mac or Max. Uh, in Europe, they were they were incredibly well known and able to sort of be in the open in this, this way. In 1852, Cushman's first uh, retirement from the stage, they decide the most open and tolerant place is going to be. They're going to go to Rome. There's a bohemian community there. They're going to go there and start a life together. And they form this. Uh, what William Weston's story, an observer called Harem Scarum of emancipated females in Rome, independent women who enjoyed an international transatlantic lifestyle that seems to us strikingly modern. Uh, it includes uh, African American sculptor Edmonia Lewis, sculptor Emma Stebbins, uh, and it is Emma Stebbins who will be the person who breaks these two up. So there are a, a large number of women living together in Rome, uh, sort of under the umbrella of a Cushman uh, run house. And as they come and go, one who arrives, actually I don't want to stop her yet, uh, is uh, Emma Stevens. Uh, I don't want to make Cushman sound like she was stepping out on Hayes. It was happening on both sides. So while all these women are living together, uh, five, six at a time, in some cases we're in the same community, um, into Cushman's home comes Harriet Godhue Hosmer, sculptor, 
uh, who Cushman met in Rome in 1854, who I love this quote from her, I honor every woman who has strength enough to step outside the beaten path that she feels that her walk lies in another, strength enough to stand up and be laughed at. A great neoclassical sculptor who was told she couldn't study, she couldn't do this as a woman, moved to Rome uh, and learned to do it anyway and became one of the most uh, uh, successful uh, uh, sculptors of the 19th century, one of the most famous uh, female sculptors of her, of her or any time. Hosmer begins an affair with Hayes and later Cushman, and Cushman finds Emma Stebbins, who as Matt mentioned is the woman who, who will care for her for all ages, is the woman that she marries, and stays married to the longest. Sculptor best known for her work, Angel of the Waters in Central Park. Another writer, another intellectual, uh, Emma Stebbins. would spend much of um, the 1860s, 1870s for her in Europe and America, but yet more intrigue. Young Emma Crow, 18 years old, called by Cushman her little lover, comes into what can become at times a triangle. Uh, Emma Crow was from St. Louis, meets Cushman in 1858, uh, and the two are so taken with each other that though um, Cushman considers himself is married to Stebbins, uh, decides that she can't live without young Crow. Uh, and, and that told an interesting story earlier um, about the actual fist fight that broke out when uh, things were going bad between Charlie Cushman and with, uh, with, with, with Hayes. That Hayes walks in, doesn't catch Cushman um, uh, having an affair, but catches her sort of writing a letter when she comes in. She, she won't show her the letter, and she says, That's, That letter is the Stebbins, isn't it? It is. They have to fight. In fact, um, uh, Hayes chases her around the house. She will actually sue uh, Cushman for money. She said she put her own career on hold to take care of her, and Cushman settled with her out of court. Uh, those who have falling out, uh, she learns another lesson in the sort of messiness of these entanglements. And so when a pro comes along and catches her eye, she decides that she can't put Stebbins through that. So what she'll do is she'll convince her nephew, who she adopts as a son, to marry Crow, move in with them. And uh, it seems that this interesting arrangement continues with Cushman and Stebbins, and also Crow and Cushman's nephew, uh, in a household like this. Mm -hmm. Her little lover. Uh, the thing to take away is it's kind of complicated and messy, but, but love often is uh, that, that the women that she attached herself to were mostly artists and a, a great uh, a, a piece by Rosalie Sully of Charlotte Cushman. Uh, Brewster wrote a number of, of, of great books. Uh, her novel, St. Martin's Summer, can be purchased and still online uh, from St. Martin's. Uh, the Harem Scarab, uh, so just off the Spanish steps in Rome, was where um, uh, Cushman lived. Matilda uh, Hayne wrote a novel, Adrian Hope, in 1866 captures Cushman in fiction, so there's a description of Cushman uh, in that novel. Harry Hosmer, The Sleeping Fawn. Uh, men would enter this bohemian enclave as well, the likes of Henry James or Nathaniel Hawthorne, who was so taken with the skill of Hawthorne and this community that he famously captures it in the Marble Fawn. There's a very, the hands of Elizabeth Brown Friday, of course, the Sevens. Maybe the most famous of any of these artists uh, of Cushman's lovers uh, and her angel of the waters. These are just some fun graphics that I found on I, the website, uh, who decided they were going to give the whirlwind roller coaster tumultuous love life of 19th century person, Charlotte Cushman, a 21st century tabloid at love and decided to blow them up as if we were talking about these people in our own time. Matilda Hayes and Charlie Cushman, roller coaster romance. Uh, Harry Hoffman, always involved in the drama. But <laughs> living out in the open. I, these are questions that are hard to answer. How open was this? Was it a well kept secret? How, how politely was all this discussed? And we don't really know. So it's to say that people sort of know, they think they know, but because of the social constructs of gender, and what is believed women are and are, are and are capable of, didn't really know what they thought they knew, and Cushman worked to keep it that way. She would never have allowed her name to be flung in tabloids like this because of her 
discretion and claim very well that whole, it's just a female friendship angle, these are okay. <laughs> Miss Devins, Charlotte's X's, X's, X. Emma Crow, what does she know? <laughs> uh, and that is really just tapping in a little bit to a very interesting life. Um, and here we are, pretty late for talking. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> Sorry about that so long. <laughs> All right. So as Jeff mentioned, uh, fascinating woman, fascinating wife, but how does she connect to the Seward family? Uh, and that's, uh, there's some existing evidence, a little bit of speculation, but we do know that they meet in the early 1850s. We know the Seward family, uh, uh, including uh, William, and especially Fanny, big fans of the theater. Uh, so they meet uh, outside of performance in Washington, D.C. He's quite taken with her, and they start with correspondence. Uh, and uh, as time goes on, they really grow to appreciate each other's company. She is a frequent uh, visitor here to Auburn, to the Seward house, as well as the Seward Washington house. Uh, and he, Seward, is very, very protective of the tub and her, I'm sorry, the freshman rather. Uh, and something I actually didn't realize until Jeff and I were looking into this is Cushman was getting a little bit of a, a harsh pushback being in Europe during the American Civil War. So we know that she is a very famous woman, uh, very well respected in the United States. Uh, and so people were saying, why are you here? Why are you not here uh, supporting the Union cause? Uh, and he sticks up for her on a, a number of occasions. And I just want to read a little excerpt from a letter that she writes him from Rome. Uh, she writes, I want this note to reach you during Christmas time, for it bears you the affectionate greeting of a sincere friend uh, for that day and many other happy ones. An opportunity is afforded to me to send this to Paris and send it to you through the ambassador's bag, which means she uh, gets it to him through diplomatic channels. You will be too busy for me to introduce upon you, Wong, and I will only tell you how anxiously I have awaited all the, uh, I have rather, uh, watched all your moments from the big distance, and how hard it is to be patient, uh, as you are, uh, and much with all these miles between us. Uh, I don't know how it would seem terrible to you, or you in my place, for you're a patient man, and I'm only an impulsive woman. But every day and every hour seems to make matters at home less clear to you. Sometimes I am faint and sick, my heart, as the clouds of justice and wickedness rise up, on the side to obscure my true vision. I cannot be in America now, and yet my every thought is there. My friend, Miss Stevens, who is making a fine statue of Horace Mann from Boston, needs me here more than my country needs me there. And my religion being that the absolute need of peoples or individuals are absolutely met by the good God. I am fain to think that my place is here when I can help those of my own sex work better than I can at uh, so she is very committed uh, to her uh, to her intellectual and artistic pursuits, and she feels that that is the best patriotic uh, service that she can perform during that time. Uh, so I just found that quite quite interesting. Um, and uh, let's see uh, the relationship with Sword and Lincoln now. So we know Sword and Cushman uh, are uh, kindred spirits, as they both kind of use that term. Uh, the Lincoln anecdote I think is particularly funny. So in July 1861, Lincoln has never met uh, Sherman Cushman. And Sword says, oh, well, in fact, she's visiting. Let me introduce you. Uh, so he does. Uh, and Lincoln goes right up to her and says, oh, Miss Cushman, uh, Cushman my favorite Shakespearean play is Macbeth. Uh, and I'd really like to see you play Lady Macbeth at some point. And she kind of uh, embarrassing, embarrassingly uh, lets him know that, well, in fact, I've actually done that many times. It's one of the things I'm most well known for. Uh, and he says, oh, and he's a little, uh, he's a little embarrassed by it. Uh, and then there's kind of an awkward silence, and they never really talk again. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then uh, just another event, I mean, there are multiple, multiple events, but it's the Booth Dinner. So we often uh, find this fascinating at, at the Seward House that uh, a little more than a year before John Wilkes Booth uh, attempts to execute Seward, he has dinner with Edwin Booth. And this dinner is actually, uh, which is John Wilkes' brother, if you don't know, this dinner is actually set up by this country. Uh, she, in fact, goes through uh, mostly Fanny, but also uh, William Seward. Uh, and uh, you know, Edwin Booth is the probably most famous male actress of the time. Uh, and uh, he knows Charlotte quite well, and he shows up at the Washington house. Uh, and Charlotte has informed uh, Fanny of sort of the, uh, 
the, the sad past of Edwin. So uh, Edwin's wife, who is now deceased, had actually been one of Charlotte's acting partners. Uh, she had been the uh, Juliet to her Romeo. Uh, and um, apparently this woman, uh, she actually uh, saves Edwin from uh, the love of wine, as it's, uh, as it's called. Um, so he, uh, he actually he gives up wine for her. They do have a child, unfortunately, she passes away just a few months later. Uh, so he and Fanny kind of talk about this. Um, and he says, no, 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 it's perfectly fine. Uh, and then he and Seward have a discussion. Uh, they're actually going to go see uh, several plays that evening. They talk about some of the characters. Uh, and then they, uh, they have a, uh, a, uh, a, uh, a little drink, and then they uh, head home for the evening. But uh, you know, just interesting to think of those two and the brother of which uh, trying to assassinate Seward, uh, as I said, just a, just a few, uh, few months later. We were like, what were they here? Uh, so here's that quote. Uh, in Senator Seward, she, Cushman, had found a new friend, something in her had immediately sensed a kindred spirit, and this witty, uh, garrulous man with a long, beaked nose and side whiskers. Uh, she laughed quick at his anecdotes, and while realizing how closely she uh, and Seward thought alike, he paralleled each other in the uh, I think that's a fantastic quote there. Uh, this letter, uh, this is actually in the collection of the University of Rochester, uh, but Jeff and I got uh, a little bit of a kick out of this. Uh, it is a letter that uh, is written um, to Janet, uh, to Janet, referring to Anna. Miss Charlotte Cushman writes, uh, writes me in a very manly letter in which, uh, like herself, she expresses a very proper, though feminine, appreciation of Anna, Anna Seward, Frederick's wife, and desires to be affectionately remembered to Anna and to yourself. Uh, I will send this letter as soon as I can. Uh, shall have acknowledged it. Uh, it will seem that Miss Cushman cannot come to Washington before the middle of October. But there's a number of these letters. As Jeff mentioned, she was a family friend. Uh, she was very, very much accepted. There are letters between her and Fred talking about a chess match that they have going for months and months. And he says, hey, next time I see you, you better have a great game for this chess that we're going to play. Um, pretty competitive about it. Um, uh, and then here are just some, uh, some newspaper uh, clippings for those dramatic readings that we discussed. So she is in failing health at this point, but in 1872, she does visit Auburn. She does a dramatic reading. And actually, I know it's uh, it's not great resolution over here, but this is actually just a few months before uh, William H. Seward passes away, but he's one of the benefactors that brings her here to Auburn. This is uh, regarding the 1875 uh, dramatic reading here. So this is actually her last dramatic reading. So her last official act during the American theater takes place here in Auburn, uh, which I think is quite interesting. Uh, and then as those of you that have come to the sewer house know, this is our diplomatic gallery uh, picture uh, of Charlotte Richmond, and this is her little note that she writes, which uh, hangs just below that. Uh, and then Auburn animation and morning. So I kind of touched on this a little bit earlier. For a woman of, of such, uh, just such fame, su such a, uh, such interest. Uh, her funeral is quite small. Um, it's really just friends and family. It takes place uh, in Boston uh, in a small church. Uh, and yeah, the, uh, really the only obituary that really goes into any detail is the Auburn papers. And they say, you know, we all you know, here at Auburn, we know Charlotte Cushman. Uh, she's sort of a, uh, an adopted uh, daughter of Auburn. And we all remember her for her many stays at the Seward House and her wonderful performances. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, we, we, again, don't pretend to know everything. Uh, oh, I will mention, uh, Jeff mentioned the Angel of the Waters. That is uh, supposed to be based on Cushman. That, that wonderful sculpture. <laughs> we have any questions if you want to ask us. Um, she performed at the YMCA in uh, one of those slides. Where else in Auburn would she have performed at that time? It's called the Opera House. Yeah. Casey Opera, Opera House. House. Opera House. Uh, and there, there was, in 2014, there was an exhibit at the Cuba that had some of their artifacts. Um, I was trying to figure out exactly where it was uh, and, and couldn't. And thought today maybe I should call Houston. Yeah, but that might come up. And I did not call Houston. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, could tell us that answer, uh, and next time we see them, we'll ask. Yeah. 
Um, you mentioned that uh, Charlotte Cushman loomed over her fellow thespians. How tall was she? She was five foot six. So not, she's not, you know, giant, but considering Seward was five three, five four, she, and she was she was considered quite tall for her age. Well, thank you so much for coming. There's plenty of cupcakes and candy left.